All right, teammates, 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 we are back once again. If this is your first time listening to the Move Swiftly podcast, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Welcome to the number one show on innovative teamwork. To my regular listeners, you already know how I get down. Mr. ABC here, always be connecting. And again, <laughs> I know I, I tell you all the time, I bring you gems of people. I bring you people that have a story. They want to see you do well. They come on here to help you get better in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And today we are going, we have someone who is going to allow you to redefine the term resilience, redefine whatever excuses, whatever little bullshit you may be going through, whatever small problems you may have. All of that shit is going to be eradicated today because I have Mr. Dan McQueen who lived through some things that is incredible, but still is progressing, still is getting better, does not walk around with the victim mentality. So with all that, Dan, welcome to the Move Swiftly podcast. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for that lovely introduction, my man. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good, man. Glad to have you on. And, you know, we could, like you said, we could just jump right into it, man, you know, because I've been keeping up with your story. I've been, you know, reading, doing my research on the show and for this show, for this episode specifically. And there was a, a situation that you had to live through where you were in shape, you know, you're, you're just doing everything. Everything seems normal, but you had some headaches, I believe it was. You had situ a situation where you're getting regular headaches. You saw someone and uh, life-changing, life-changing things happen when you got those results. So I'll let you kind of tell the story and then, you know, we'll kind of go from there. Cheers, brother. So yeah, my story takes place in 2014 in jolly old London, England. So back in London, England, let's go back in time. Mm -hmm. Travel caps on. Uh, London, England, you know, fishing ships, bad teeth, the tube, you know, think about London vibes. I'm living my best life over there, working in tech for a company called Hootsuite. Social media management platform, working with them. Lots of late nights. You know, blowing my paycheck in a single weekend. You get paid once a month in London. This took me a few months to figure out. But man, were those some good first few weekends there. Let me tell you that much. <laughs> but uh, started having these headaches, man. They got progressively worse over a few weeks. Taking painkillers like candy for them. My head was pounding Mm -hmm. And then the tube one day, the tube tight zigzag around London. Going towards Nine Hill Gate tube station. I remember now in the district line. A slow roll for those that know. The headaches were so bad, my vision started to go spotty and I see stars and it started to fade. Like my vision started to fade. It was pretty scary. Hmm. It was a race to see who's going to get to the platform first. I arrive at Nine Hill Gate tube station, step onto the platform, mind the gap, and the curtain, the light goes out. I can't see. Now, I want to ask you, man, an able-sided person your whole life, all of a sudden you're thrust into the depths of blindness on a tube station in London. What would you do? What's your first thoughts? What's your thoughts about this? I I'm just scared. You know, I'm like, the hell is going on? <laughs> yeah, well, I had a pretty similar reaction. I didn't say anything. I just stood there. The world swirled around me. And I waited and I thought, how am I going to get out of this pickle? Like, I don't want to make myself known that I can't see because I'll be like a mark for, you know, all those nefarious people that are around London areas and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. and I waited and I waited for three long minutes, man, longest three minutes of my life. And my vision came back and I carried on my day. But the next day I went back to Annie. Annie is accident emergency in the UK, like ER in the States I would gather. I told him what had happened, like something's really wrong here. This is not normal. People need to go blind. I couldn't see, man. Mm -hmm. This is just crazy, right? Yeah. They ran some tests again. They thought it was vertigo. They sent me home. But on the way out, they told me I could always get my eyes checked in an optometrist. An optometrist would say, yeah, the eyes are extension of the brain. Sure, okay. That makes sense, I guess. Next day, the headaches were back with a vengeance, man. They were talking not blinding headaches, but pretty damn close. My head was pounding. I found myself in Mr. Patel's chair. Mr. Mattel was midway through the routine exam when he stops the exam. He excuses himself in the room and he comes back a few minutes later with a sealed envelope which he hands to me. He tells me to go directly to Moorfield's hospital, which I did. Well, tell a lie. I stopped at home first to grab a Jack Reacher book by the child, a phone charger, and a bite to eat. Then I went to Moorfield's hospital. Hand them that same sealed envelope. They run the same test again, then escalate me to Charing Cross Hospital. They escalate me up. We're moving this along. This is progressing, I'm thinking. This is positive. Hmm. Now, it turns out I had a dangerous build of pressure in my brain caused my growth in my patina gland. Turns out it required emergency brain surgery tomorrow. 
Terms have been working to change altogether. After a frantic back and forth with folks in Canada, the last text message my mom received reads, I'll see you soon, Mom. I think I'll have a new haircut. I'll see you. Love, Dan. Hmm. Mom's in the air flying to London on June 21st, 2014. I'm on the operating table. Something goes horribly wrong. It goes pear-shaped on me. And a massive wound in the brain, a brain hemorrhage. I think the cyst burst when they operated. One lines and finds I'm in critical condition. I was in a coma for four weeks. I was in and out of consciousness for months after this. Things were dicey, touch and go. When all was said and done, I was learning how to walk, how to talk, and how to smile again. That's where my story kicks off, my man. Wow. You know, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there. And what my initial thought, at least, is right after something like that happens, what do you do, right? Because now it's like, okay, I, I'm i in a situation where a lot of the things that I wanted to, I, I would be able to, 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 do, to do, I can't do anymore. But somehow you were able to parlay that and transition that into a way in which you can inspire people. And now you're an international speaker. You know, now you're doing things to help other businesses, help other people improve their life. So I guess sort of walk us through the transition from that moment to where you're now doing the work you're doing and speaking so regularly and, you know, impacting lives and making making it so people are continuously getting better and you're improving the businesses and things of that nature. Yeah, well, let me tell you right now, it's not a smooth, quick transition. This took years. And the first few years were fight, were like fight for sure, not flight, but fight. I was fighting for my next one. I was fighting for my next breath, my next walk, my next step. Mm -hmm. It took 45 minutes again, two, then 40, then 35, then 30, then 25, then 20. Mm. Every day was a grind, arduous, difficult, one step forward, three steps back. And I'm like, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. Wait, the nurse got me talking again, man, which took me out of the park. And kids playing football, soccer across the park. And she goes, Dan, those kids across the park, they don't think you're good enough to talk. Dan, they don't think you're good enough to talk. And I found out pretty quickly, that's a big trigger for me, being told I'm not good enough to do something. Mm -hmm. And I yelled across the park, I'll spare your team some profanities I yelled, but let's just say I found my voice. And I found out pretty quickly that's a motivator for me. Like to prove you wrong burns deep, man. That's mm -hmm. that's a toxic fuel that burns the freight trainer. But walking into Broadway, I want to show you a story about walking into Broadway, man. To show you how difficult this was for me, right? So have you been to London, my man? Have you been to London? Say that again. Have you been to London? I haven't, no. All right. So let me set the scene for you and your listeners. Tooting Broadway is an area in South London, okay? An area they call up and coming. Mm -hmm. uh, sirens, drugs, right. gangs. It's dirty, it's hectic, and boys are busy. Walk with a cane and walk with an eye patch. After four months in a wheelchair, I'm literally Bambi on ice. I turn the corner to walk on the high street for the first time. I immediately get slammed into by someone. Hmm. Stagger back a few feet. Someone scurries past me on the right hand side. I thought I was done with the rats. Someone had been stabbed on the sidewalk over here. I'm thinking, it's a pretty wild place on her to walk. Man. After a few days of this, I was thinking, this is the worst place on her to walk in the world. Can't they see I'm trying to walk here? Can't they see I'm trying? Hmm. And then one day, my perspective shifted. Maybe this isn't the worst place on her to walk in the world. No, maybe it's the best. If I can walk here, I can walk anywhere. The tune Broadway didn't change, right? Right. We went from the worst to the best in my mind, and my mood reflected that. What are you looking at in your life you're convinced is the worst? Convinced is the absolute worst. Hey, maybe it is. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can find a way to turn down the suck a little bit. Shift that perspective a little bit. Iron Mike Tyson famously said, everyone's got a plan to get punched in the mouth. Now, your punch may not be a brain hemorrhage, right? Facts. What are the odds of that, right? But it will be a right. job loss, a breakup, a diagnosis for you, a loved one. You mm -hmm. will take that punch in the mouth. How you respond? I'm offering a compass, not a map, but a compass. It always points towards true north. We'll do things like mindset, perspective, and hacks. Hacks that will allow you and your team to be better than yesterday, tomorrow. My name is Dan McQueen. 
And the reason why I told that story about learning to walk and tune Broadway is when you change the way you look at the world, the world look at changes. And you don't need a brain hemorrhage to understand that. That's a perspective shifting story that I tell about learning to walk and tune Broadway. But man, this was a grind. Like this was chop wood, carry water every day, getting in the wheelchair in a little bit shorter time, a little longer time. Chipping away this day after day after day. I realized quite quickly it wasn't what happened, but what you thought about it that matters. It's not what happens to you, but what you think about it that matters. That's Nepotitis through line. Mm -hmm. The old philosopher. And I went to work, man. Rehab, back to work, two half days a week, three half days a week. I'll get my life back to get my life back on track. I used to be able to move the tube before I went to work in the morning. I'd take the tube in and she'd go off on her walk. One way I didn't show up about a year into this rehab. What was the um I don't mean to cut you off there, but what what was the rehab process like for something like that? Like what was the kind of walk us through what the day to day was? So uh, you know what the listeners and, and anyone that may be going through some difficult times now, I think and me, I, I actually told my ACL too. So the uh the rehab process is tough. Uh, it just sucks. There's no other way. <laughs> There's no other word to describe it. But I, I feel like it is important to emphasize to people when it comes to how to get back, how to whatever it is you're going through, whatever trials, whatever unforeseen circumstance may happen, that rehab process is going to dictate how how you're able to make it back and the way you you shift the perspective, like you said. That's for sure, bud. So rehab rehab's a bitch. Mm -hmm. um, you're in a wheelchair. Getting in the wheelchair took 45 minutes, man. 45 minutes of struggling to move my muscles and to, like, get into the wheelchair. I'm in the wheelchair, then I'm wheeled off to go have a shower, man. You're in a wheelchair, wheeled enough to get to shower. It's the most, like, humiliating thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Every day you're doing this, right? You're getting showered off, you're going back, you're drying off, you're back in the bed. This takes, you know, 45 minutes to get back in the wheelchair to the bed to get changed for the day. And you do light rehab in the gym you know you're doing slight stuff there like i don't know movement up and down on the steps if you can in a position walking the even bars even bars are what you hold when you're unstable on your feet it's a grind man but you got to incrementally pick small winnable targets and chip away at this right. day after day week after week month after month you're chipping away what you can control control the controllables don't look at the big <laughs> mountain look at the next step the next step that you got to focus on Mm -hmm. but man it's not it's easier said than done right like the, the mountains there you know you were back up that mountain last week mm -hmm. but now you're at the very bottom and you can barely take the next step man so like focus on what you can do and control and incrementally ratchet up your response and your in your rehab and day after day week after week month after month year after year you're slowly chipping away at this mm -hmm. so this took a year to get back to the office right Mm -hmm. a year of being in, in rehab and walking and talking and all this fun stuff and so i used to meet my mom at the two before i went to work right right um one day i didn't show up she calls my cell no response walks back to my flat in hammersmith opens the door finds me unconscious on the floor not a good sign right calls 999 like 911 in the states but in right. the uk 999 i'm rushed to the hospital have emergency brain surgery. I wake up the next day hearing the beeping noise, the heart monitor going off behind me, you know, beep, 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 beep. What happened? What happened? What happened? Well, Danny had a second brain injury. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? The shunt into my brain to block the hydrocephalus or water in the brain. Hmm. And, you know, I talk about those pretty light hearted tones now, man, but like I was gutted. Like, yeah. I'm for a year to get back to the office, you get this behind me and move my life forward. And then I'm ripped from underneath me, like the carpets pulled from underneath me, and like I'm back on the ground. Like, you gotta be kidding me, man. Right. And it took everything to keep my mindset not going down the pity spiral. And I, you know, I did go down the pity spiral for a little bit. This isn't fair. Woe's me, woe's me. Because it's not fair, man. What the hell? Twice? Mm -hmm. You tell me this happens twice? Right. All the progress was washed away, but I realized that I knew how to rehab. And this took probably a good a good month to get to the stage where like I knew how to rehab, right? I'm like, well, I've re I know how to rehab better than I did last time. Right. So I got to work and I wasn't in a wheelchair this time, so at least I could walk and you know, I was making bigger gains and but man, I can't tell you how low that was. I described my recovery like a W.
Right. The first setback's down here. Mm -hmm. I kind of scurry back up to about halfway up. The second setback's not where the first one was much lower. I call it the depths of the human experience where your hopes and dreams go to get snickered at and laughed at and die. Right. Like, you had to keep your mindset pure, man. Yeah. And now, I, I, I know you you have a great deal of appreciation for the, the doctors and the people that looked out for you during that time. Oh, but good. I think it's... I think it's also important to at least mention any, was there any family members? Were there any friends? Were there people that were there to support? Cause I, I couldn't imagine, I, I could imagine what they're going through. You know, I'm now meeting you here and I'm looking at like, man, but I could only imagine the people, the loved ones that were around you. Can you kind of just go to speak on how, how much of their support meant to you when it comes to coming back and, you know, living the lifestyle you live now? Oh, for sure. My parents came over from, London, from Vancouver to London immediately. Mm -hmm. um they arrived in a coma it was not the best entry point to me but i was alive still and kicking and you know they were told i wasn't going to make it wow and they were through thick and thin with me with rehab and you know i'm in london right so it's like still english speaking but like a foreign country mm -hmm. all new to me everything's greek to me it's like you're trying to figure out this medical system and going this appointment here and this appointment there and right so crucial for this to make happen. My brother came over from Germany to be with me and support me. Uh, he lives in uh, San Diego now, but he was living in Germany at the time. Mm -hmm. um, they were in, like they were crucial for this. Friends came over from Vancouver all the time to visit me, right. cheer me on, support me. Right. My one friend, friend Claire came over, and she went off to Ireland right off the hop. And you know, in that time, she was in saw me in London, went up mm -hmm. to Ireland, came back a week later. I was walking from this stage forward. And she goes, Dan, it's remarkable. You were in a wheelchair when I left and you're walking now. Wow. I want to show them that I'm trying, that I'm, I'm worthy of the praise you're giving me. Cause like, yeah. you're praising those, praising me. Like, Dan, you're doing so well. You're rehabbing so hard. I'm like, well, I'm not, I could do more. Right. And I wanted to show her that I'm trying hard. I'm worthy of the praise you're giving me. Hmm. But friends and family made this possible. They were the life raft that kind of kept me afloat. Yeah. Hospital and doctors were crucial, but like without the love and support, man, I'm afraid that you're going to get washed on the rocks. Yeah. And, and uh, I want to make sure you listeners get a hold of that because too often nowadays do we get into situations where we're addicted to confrontation. We're addicted to watching people go at it with each other. And with these social media devices, the aspect and the ability to really create genuine friendships and genuine face-to-face -face dialogue it's a challenge for young people i could i could see it being a very challenging thing to get those friendships but you never know what a person's going through you never know how much you're just simply showing up is going to get a person and you could correct me if i'm wrong but i'm sure that these people showing up kept you from just saying, fuck, look, I can't do this anymore. It's just seeing their eyes, seeing the support. Hey, you're walking now. Hey, you're doing this now. Those types of things, I, I think, are those small things. Like you said, those small little things are crucial when it comes to the development and, and any sort of comeback, regardless of how severe the actual injury is. And and that's actually what I, the next point I wanted to make with you is I see you work now. You've worked with several companies. You've hosted several workshops. You've worked with some major brands can you kind of like walk us through a little bit about what the feeling is like when people hear your story for the first time whether it's a company or whether it's a person at work you know kind of walk us through the, the the transition and the journey that you take potential clients on yeah for sure so my story is about my experience so it's quite personal to me and you know i tell my story not so much for the attaboys, look what I've been through, although I'll be honest mm -hmm. on that. There's probably a bit of that in there for sure. But it's more so so you can see what I've done and look what you can do as well. Yes. Did these brain scans um, last a couple of years ago in uh, Health Health Tech Connect, a company in Surrey, BC, Canada. And they're like leading edge brain scans. And my results came back as, as average, you know. They asked these questions like, you know, like Apple, dog, cat mouse and they track the synapses fire and see how the results are like are these expected or different or normal my results are average right two brain injuries that's a phenomenal result but i read this is shockingly average i've recovered so well and i'm shockingly average you got to be kidding me man <laughs> Look at what I've done. i'm better than average man right. I realize, you know what that means that i'm no better or smarter than anyone on this call today I, right. i've just chosen to go forwards 
nose over the toes of my board, riding this wave down with everything I got because that's what I can do. I can control what I can control and I can focus on what I can focus on. Don't worry about the faff you can't deal with. Focus on what's in front of your face, man. And right. focus on that with everything you've got. And I believe, believe you me, you can make this happen. Mm -hmm. I played Monopoly. This is off piece story, but I'm going to tell you anyways. I yeah. played Monopoly a lot with my family in Gibson's. We have a summer house in Gibson's. Mm -hmm. Monopoly, right? I haven't played Monopoly in years. I'm a pretty competitive guy. I might have Googled how to win a Monopoly. <laughs> when I play Monopoly, but hey, yeah. they could have done the same thing. So it's not on me. <laughs> but I Googled it and found all these rules of like, you know, don't don't focus on the railroads and don't worry about the the utilities. Focus on getting a Monopoly and then build up from there. And, and don't worry about the properties that are expensive. Just get a, a, a slow stakes property and get a Monopoly and build it up. So like, Okay, cool. I've read this. I'm going around and I'm landing on stuff like I'll pass on that. Thank you. Land on Park Place, man. Park Place. Mm -hmm. Baller ass location, man. Mm -hmm. You want to buy that then? No, thank you. I don't want to buy it. Dan, do you even know how to play Monopoly? Yeah, I think I do. Mm -hmm. Went around and around again. I got like the Marvin's Gardens, the yellow one. And then got that Monopoly locked up, man. We got some nice hotels on there. We got some nice houses. We got some nice cribs. All right. Guess what? You land on that baby, that's a thousand bucks. Game's a wrap, man. My brother's most complete game of Monopoly's ever seen in his life. If you know you got a plan that's dead to rights, mm -hmm. if you know you got the right path, man, don't waver when people say you don't know what you're doing. Stick right. to the guns, man. This plan worked. I rock my Monopoly. In life, I'm rocking right now because I'm sticking to the plans. I know it works, and I'm hammering that. Mm -hmm. Hammer it. Hammer it, baby. Right. If there is anyone listening in, any companies, any businesses, anybody that would – want to reach out to you or want to have you at least speak to their employees, their staff, what, first of all, what's sort of the requirement or what's the criteria you look for when it comes to working with people and what is the, what is the best way to, to get in touch with you? Best way to get in touch is mcqueendan.com. Mm -hmm. We'll link up in the show notes, M-A-C-Q-U-E-E-M-Dan.com. The requirement is just simply, if you're willing to be better than yesterday, mm -hmm. Your team is willing to challenge the status quo and improve their lot and understand what they're doing. I'll work with you guys. I'll challenge you. I'll, I'll push you forward. I'll share my stories, my lessons, my perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I think this stuff works, man. But I would, it's, you know, I think it's a good story. But I would, it's mine. You know, it's like it's 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 in my soul, man. Like I can't I can't not be passionate about telling this because like I I was dead to rights, man. Like I was I didn't think I could make it through this. Right. Be cool. I thought it was dead to rights, man. But I'm still kicking and I'm still here because I didn't let go. I held on and I held on and I held on. And eventually the dawn broke, man. I wasn't sure if it was going for a while, but I wasn't going to let go. I wasn't going to make the, the kill shot for them. Mm -hmm. If I was going to go, they had to come get me. Yeah. And it didn't go. And I'm here. And I talk about my disease now, the, the brain hemorrhage, like in clowning terms, man. I talk about you in just disrespectful terms because you tried to get me twice and you didn't get me, man. So, like, you know what? Jog on. Yeah. yeah. I got no respect for you. I got no time for you because you ain't you ain't shit, bud. But mm -hmm. like this combative mindset, this combative attitude, like it's worked for me, but maybe it doesn't work for you. But I'm telling you, like motivation is very fickle. Mm -hmm. Don't wait for a motivation wave that you think is like altruistic or like healthy. Ride the wave that comes, man, because you don't know when the next wave will come. Mm -hmm. Ride the wave that comes and just harness that and make it work. Proving someone wrong worked for me. Maybe it doesn't work for you. I'm not transitioning that to service because your success is my success. Mm -hmm. When I beat you, all due respect, when I beat you, that motivation disappears. It was never there. When it's service-based, when your success is my success, I can cheer on your podcast for years going forward. Mm -hmm. When we're working together, your success is my success. It's a, it's a helpful place that motivation come from. Mm -hmm. But like, don't judge the way that it comes, baby. Right if it comes. All right. So what do you what do you see as like a a next phase? Like you know, when it comes to the to the work you're doing now, do you do you have a vision for it for the next five years, ten years? What would be the the ultimate goal for when it comes next? What comes next? Um, maybe on my podcast going back up and running. I've got my podcast myself. Play loose, look tight. Document the process my faster. Mm -hmm. It's on pause right now. I can maybe get enough gigs going to get that professionally edited. Right now, I edit it myself, and man, it is a Bush League operation. It's a good podcast, but the editing is pretty rough and ready. I'll be honest, I did it myself. It's pretty ghetto. But 
the game plan for this is just scale speaking, man, in a way that's meaningful and impactful. I want to make a difference in this place. Mm -hmm. And I want to change the way you look at the world, man, because I didn't think there'd be a way through for me. I thought it was dead to rights a number of times. And like, if you don't have the help I had, man, you're finished. If I can give you the keys, if I can give you the blueprint, the compass, man, you can find a way through this, but you got to put the work in, baby. Yeah. But like, it's possible, man. Yeah. But it's work based, and you got to put the work in rep after rep, time after time, time after time. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, uh, you know, this has been a pleasure getting to know you. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. And I, so the way, I don't know, you, you, I don't know if you've listened to any shows yet, but the way I close out all the shows, Dan, is I want you to use, I want you to use your imagination a little bit. Go back to the, your younger self, the self that was going through that, you know, pretend that he just clicked into the Zoom room, give him some words of encouragement and we'll officially close. <laughs> Ask for forgiveness, not for permission. Mm -hmm. Get after it, baby. Short and sweet. <laughs> forgiveness, not permission, and just get after it. That's a message to you listeners as well. Again, appreciate the work you're doing. Looking forward to staying in touch with you and, you know, kind of keeping up with your journey and seeing how things work out. Fellow teammates, continue to move swiftly. We will talk more soon. <laughs>